Welcome to Lovely, a show about law, love, and life. Live a happy life using the universal law of love at the heart of your decision making. And of course, real laws too. I'm your host, Bahar Ansari, a hippie and happy lawyer turned IT founder turned, well, me, a consciously creative counselor. This show is built on one simple principle that us as human beings do things for only two reasons love, our ultimate self fulfillment, or laws, natural and man made. What transcends both is creativity, it's innovation, it's love empowered by laws, it's love. Be love, learn law, spread love. Ready? I want to introduce a special guest today, Mika Newton. She's a friend and she was my very, very first client when I became a lawyer. Mika has been a professional singer since she was 15 in Ukraine and, and was a super popular artist in her country. She then competed at the 2011 Eurovision contest where 43 countries participated and came in fourth out of 25 finalists. And this was a huge honor for her country, Ukraine. After her win and at the height of her career in Europe, she decided that she wanted to pursue her dream in the US. While many advised against it, she followed her intuition to California. Since moving here, she's been acting and modeling and working with some of the biggest brands in the world like McDonald's and Apple. I've personally been a huge fan of her since I first met her, and I think that her biggest talent is her giant personality and strong heart. So welcome. Thank you for such a warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having me today. I know how hard you've been working on this idea, and you know, to start something, you need to go through something to develop this idea. And I'm super excited for you. I think uh, what you want to say to the world is so strong. And I'm really, really uh, super happy to be your guest. Thank you. I know you're kind of one of the first people who believe in me. You were literally my first client. First of all, I wasn't your first client. First client was Mozart. It's my <laughs> wide life. He's now uh, eight years old. He's rolling around. I was trying to get him out of the house, but he wouldn't just, he would just annoy me. So you can hear him probably a little bit. And so he was your first client. He was the troubled kid who got the mom in trouble. <laughs> Honestly, that is the funniest story and the craziest story of an immigrant in LA because like in Ukraine, no one's just going to go and sue you, right? <laughs> and so I, I just want to tell the quick story, <laughs> kind of fun and kind of not. Uh, so uh, I left to Ukraine and um, just to perform and do some interviews. And my friends are, was sitting, babysitting Mozart. And, um, and then when I got back, I got served that, I mean, <laughs> that Mozart, who was like seven uh, months old puppy, he bit that woman, and now she's poor woman, needs surgeries and all that stuff. I was shocked because, first of all, white Labrador, usually they're like cats. You know, they are the cutest and nicest dogs. He was a hyper, but he was never aggressive or anything. So she said he bit her. I was literally, I remember when I, when I got the documents, and they've been served just like the documents under my uh, door, not even in the mailbox, which was crazy. And I remember I was kind of started shaking, like, oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? And then I started reading, I was like, why me? Because I wasn't even there, right? So they wanted to sue me for $1 million. I think <laughs> Google right now probably uh, thought I had tons of money and wanted to just screw us over. You know, the funny thing is it wasn't even, uh, the allegation wasn't even a dog bite. The, the allegation was that the dog ran into her and because, like, she, the dog collided with her leg, her leg broke or something ridiculous anyway. Um, it, honestly, emotionally, it was very hard because, you know, when you, uh, when I moved here, like, everyone told me, like, law works in America. It's not Ukraine. You can't corrupt anyone. You have to pay taxes, you know, because in Ukraine is like, oh, under the table. Oh, you need a surgery. Okay, it's going to cost you, and you give money in an envelope. This is how Ukraine runs, unfortunately, and a lot of stuff you can solve if you know someone and, and someone knows someone. Here, like, you really need to be very, very careful on um, 
on a being good citizen. And I remember I was only on my one work visa. Oh my gosh, we can talk forever because now I'm like having this, oh my gosh, I should tell about O1 uh, and then a green card. So there's a lot to talk about. But so Mozart, yeah, I got very scared because I didn't know what to do. I've never been served. I never... Um, been a bad girl who did something wrong to get served, you know? So that was a little pretty shocking to hear. And I will never forget our deposition. Let's talk about that because that's pretty funny. But this was a long thing. Like, I know we're laughing about it and it's like we're telling the story. Yeah. But this was a long lawsuit. Like, they sued you, you got served, which obviously is sliding it on the door isn't good enough, but moving on. Um, the lawsuit went on for a year, a year and a half. We litigated, we went to court, we did depositions. Like it, it was, it was an ordeal. It went on for a while and they were super unreasonable in terms of demand. So we actually ended up going to trial and of course winning, but, um, what I was where you were going to talk about, <laughs> about the deposition. I was sitting in the court and I was like, literally like your heart is bumping because it's, it's just, you were kind of worried, like you don't know. I know the truth was on our side, but like you never know. So I was pretty scared and then she was like lying. I was listening to her and I was like, God, why am I going through this? And I'm the person who always knows that whatever happens to me, it's for a reason and usually for a good reason, even if it's kind of bad experience and you're nervous and you're stressed and everything is draining. I was like, okay, so first thing, now I can act it. Now I know how this all happens. So if I get a role like that, I will use all these emotions. And that was the first thing. And then we become friends as well, you know, so it's kind of, or a negative experience brought me into positive. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It was it was a funny experience, and at least for me, it was super funny because it was my my uh, kind of my first solo case that I took on my own. I was a litigator back then. I was getting into litigation, and we looked like this. Like we were dressed kind of the same, and we were what twenty six, twenty seven. Like and we showed up to this deposition and there is these old men around the table and it, it's just a funny experience in, in the legal industry in general just because of, of the sexism. You want to want to win something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's still, um, it's not common to show up to courts like looking like this or with makeup or a couple of little blondes, like that's not the statistics in the legal industry. It's still majority um, white male dominance. So uh, that was an experience all by itself, and it's always funny to be kind of um, underestimated and then come up on top. It's usually when I uh, say I'm a singer, and I was like, oh, singer, oh, cute girl. And then you go and say, you're like, oh, you are an actual singer. I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> like, I'm singing since I'm five, you know? She's talking about this little voice. I look at you and I see my reflection I can see myself right in your eyes It's like an invisible connection Tying us together here tonight I found love but this is so much stronger Than anything I ever felt before I let go, I know that you're my waiting
my whole life in it around singing and then when I moved here then I discovered acting because I always wanted to act and uh, honestly I even started acting just because I didn't have any American friends so I wanted to practice my English and then I was like oh it's probably going to help me when I'm going to memorize all my monologues and work with the uh, partners oh it's going to help me with my English so that's how I actually started acting as well but I want to actually ask you some questions. So um, all my life, I always thought that uh, everyone knows what we want to do when they grow up, right? I figured it out when I was far that I'm very, uh, you know, like very, I want to perform all the time. I want to perform for my parents. And I started asking them to bring um, friends and family, you know, and the audience since five. And no one act, no one is a musician. Like my mom is a nurse. My dad um, repairs the cars. He's painting them. It's like no one like would even think that, oh, you can be a singer on a stage, right? When did you figure it out that you want to be a lawyer? You know, I was always like this tiny negotiator. Um, well, I was never tiny. I was always like taller, but uh, I was such a little negotiator and I really loved fashion. So it kind of could have gone either way. Uh, like my parents thought I would go to either beauty or design school or something along the lines of law. But, you know, law was always such a huge part of my life. Like my mom was a political science major. She's been always super political. Like I grew up in Iran, so laws kind of dictate everything you do from your makeup, your hair, where you go out. So it's always been a part of my life. Um, I remember, I think when I was in middle school in Iran before I moved, uh, that I kind of learned that I couldn't be a judge in Iran and that sparked an interest into the legal industry. Um, so yeah, I've, I've known for a really long time. And even now I still dip my hand in creative stuff because that I still have that part of me but you're right not a lot of people know it might be things that you love like a certain characteristic of your personality that stands out like for me it was that and then you gravitate towards it but sometimes what you love to do doesn't become a job and and I think that's that's what's different um for people who are creative who creativity is in their industry maybe maybe that's the differentiator and you knew, you knew since you were little, right? Five, since five. I also think the huge part um, is our parents. Yeah. That who played the biggest role, you know, and, uh, and I'm really, honestly, the older I get, the more I'm grateful uh, am that they were letting me sing. They were letting me to do it. Even uh, I'm like from very small town in the west of Ukraine, next to the mountains. It's like 16,000 people, you know, only three schools. So to be a singer, or even think about that, it was almost like, are you an alien? Like, I didn't even tell. So I started competing with, uh, in um, singing competitions when I was like nine. I couldn't even tell at the school that why I was absent. I was like, oh, I'm just sick or something. And I would go to this Ukrainian huge competition and win it. And I couldn't even come to school and show off because everyone would think I'm crazy. And why would I want to sing? Everyone wants to be a lawyer or a doctor, you know, some big, um, a, a, like big job singing. Like, can you make money? As it's, honestly, I never even took my uh, singing uh, that serious. I just did it because I loved it and I loved the results. And I knew if I worked so hard on a song or whatever I work hard on, I can win. So I wanted the results. I got addicted to the company. And, and then when I started, uh, actually when I met my first producer, who um, gave me the contract that I didn't really actually read. <laughs> I mean, I've had like, okay, seven years, I belong to him and he's gonna produce me and manage me. And, um, and I remember that um, I, because we as musicians or creative people will love what we do so much that you are so happy just to work with the manager, especially he was like a number one manager in, 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 in the country. Like he was top three, the strongest. I was like, oh my gosh, 
wear it your side, sure. And you're 15, 16 years old, so you uh, don't know about law. And actually, no one really teaches us. No one really tells you, you know, read the contract. Just make sure you know what's happening after those seven years. And as I told you before, I signed the contract because I was so excited. My dad kind of read it, like you don't have lawyers. Like here is almost like if you're getting into something, you hire the lawyer. In Ukraine, it's just like whatever, let me read it myself. You know, we don't have that knowledge that it's very serious and you have to protect yourself. You just get excited and you want to sign anything they give you, especially based on the reputation of the person you want to work with. And it's the opportunity of a lifetime for a 16 year old. You're thinking about my dream coming true. I don't care about like, so I'll give me anything, you know? Small town, of course. And I've been sitting for seven years and now, whoa, straight to the top manager. I was, um, I was sitting at the competition and I won first place and he was a judge on the competition. So that's how we met. And then he's like, okay, let's, let's work. I didn't even believe he was like real deal in the beginning because <laughs> I knew his name, but I didn't really know how he looked like. So, so I remember then when I decided that seven years were enough to work with, right? I think that was an amazing seven years. I grew up with him. He did uh, an amazing job as a, as a manager, but I felt like I'm growing it. You know, I wanna, I wanna um, just split up. And uh, my friend who was like a big lawyer in Ukraine, he's like, okay, let me read your contract. What's happening there? Like, I literally got lucky, guys. Like, it's not even funny that he was like, okay, let me read it. So he was reading right in front of me. He's like, hey, dude, do you know that in one month, if you don't tell him, if you don't uh, write him a letter, it just automatically renews on another seven years. I was like, what? Can you imagine if I wouldn't just randomly stick with him and he would just say, okay, let me take a look on and give you some advice. So I just got literally lucky that a month before those seven years were ending, he just read it and said, yeah. So I got literally lucky and we just sent him a letter. He was pissed, <laughs> Anyways, but at least legally we're, we were correct. Uh, you said something earlier that I just want to go back quickly to. You brought up your parents and I've met your parents and I was thinking like the last couple of days uh, a lot about this. Like, um, what is it that we have in common in our in our friendship or in our personality? Because we both of us have very strong, strong personalities and we go after what we want. And I think having such supportive parents uh, have so much to do with it. Like I know your parents, especially your dad is your biggest fan. <laughs> I've, I've seen him, I know that. Um, so of course, you know, your parents taking you to all of this and supporting your dream was a big part of you being here. Talk about a little bit about, you know, your accomplishments as a young person, you know, during those seven years, you were 16 when you moved to the city on your own and kind of launched your career. How was that for, for young girl in, in this industry? So I feel very grateful and literally the older I get, the more I understand that what they've done, especially in a, such a small town where everyone judges everyone it's super judgmental country and they everyone knows about each other all the time especially when it's a small town and i was thinking like dang they are risky just to want your kid like okay just go sing you know you 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 don't do anything else just go sing on a stage now i understand how crazy my parents are and risky i was like oh now it makes sense why i am is that cuckoo maluku how i'm saying because you have to be really uh, a different person to want to be on a stage, want to be an actor, want to be rejected so much, want to compete, you know? And um, so I loved com competing with others. But what I did, and I think that was genius, I have never lis listened to anyone who performed. So I would just go, perform, and leave. And I never, ever known who was there as well with me. And then I will just show up, you know, at the end I say like our third place goes to, second place goes to, and then first place goes to my a, a real name, Oksana Britsai, right? And I was like, oh, that's nice. Again, I did it. 
So I think the biggest thing that I was just fortunate enough to get this advice from my teachers and from my parents is your biggest competition is yourself. So I was constantly competing. And if I would win that first place, it wasn't enough. I wanted another uh, competition. I wanted hardest song, you know, then I picked Celine Dion, which was like the hardest for me. And that's how I met my uh, manager and I signed the contract. So before I went to that competition, I moved to Kiev when I was 15. My dad was with me for around a year. And um, I moved to study at the college, Circus and Variety College, where it was only like nine people who got, um, uh, I mean, no, eight people and a government uh, scholarship gave us the, the free uh, studying. So that was pretty exciting. And the, 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 the parts about my accents, you know, of course, everyone is hearing it. And I'm like so always annoyed by that because so this is my karma, guys. Um, my first language is Ukrainian, and when I moved to Kiev, everyone speaks Russian, including teachers. So I show up with that Ukrainian, and I'm like, oh my gosh, now I have to learn Russian. And Russian is kind of like, I think, Italian and Spanish, right? They're kind of similar, but kind of not. So, so I show up, right? And all those like artists come, <laughs> everyone is stylish, they're in in the best college in the country and I'm like this from west of Ukraine you know with my own style kind of a little cheesy and freaking I have an accent like a strong one and I remember I show up there is probably like a liter um, the history of music or something and he speaks Russian so I had to write in Russian but I didn't know really some letters so I would write in Ukrainian everything what he was saying just to remember so that I can uh, pass the test so that was really funny so then so when I was 15 right I moved to Kiev but I learned Russian I tried to get rid of my accent and when everything got good uh I was trying to because it's such a long story and I want to like talk forever uh so I was competing I met my producer we started recording the album uh that album got picked up in the biggest TV series. It got super popular around uh, all like um, USSR countries. It went about their uh, like young soldiers. And six, six songs were mine on what soundtracks. So that's how my name started picking up and I became really popular. And uh, then I left my producer that I was of course touring, It's Never Enough trying to be like pretty fast and then I went to Eurovision I had another uh manager who was helping me to get everything together because I was managing myself for two years it was the hardest thing ever women alone in the music industry is nothing fun and I remember I talked to my PR agent and like she was kind of managing me too she's a woman as well I, I remember we were thinking and sitting and like this is the hardest thing ever. Sometimes you just need need to be a man to sh you know, just to show up and say, hey, this is, this is, this is, because I think that's why I even, uh, I never wore pink color, never cute colors. I always was kind of like, oh, white or black or red, you know, I'm always in, and very masculine and some man would say, oh, you're not uh, sexy. I was like, thank God in my head. That's a whole point. I don't want you to look at me like I'm sexy. But I remembered it was screwing me over too because you're already established singer, right? Everyone wants to work with you. And then you try to go to the TV channels and you feel that like, oh, woman, what are you doing here? Like, get a man, you know, like something like that, especially like, just get married. Why are we like struggling over here? And I always, um, it's another funny story because I, I never told anyone that I want to get married or have kids. Cause I thought if I say this, I'm going to be the weakest person in Ukraine. Cause that what all women in Ukraine want to do. They just want to get married. They want to look good. So they get a better husband with more money. And that that's it. That's all your, uh, 
kind of career. And I was like, no, I can, I can perform and win stuff. If I work hard, I can, you know, I can do something. And I truly believed in that. It was such a hard um, thing to understand for me. So I would never say that I want kids or get married. And my friend who was my manager all these years, I, I was in Ukraine recently. And she said, like, honestly, I thought you never wanted kids. I was like, what? Like, you're my best friend. Why would you, how would you think that? She's like, you always were like, so like holding yourself into the topic and you never kind of show us. I was like, of course, I didn't want, I didn't want you to think I'm this wee girly girl. That's why I hate pink. And the last three years, I let myself like, no, I'm woman. I love pink. So now I, I'm into pink color. I almost wore a pink jacket today. <laughs> Um, it's interesting you say that. I mean, I brought it up in my industry and it's the same in your industry. And I think this is just something that we're dealing with in the world in every country. Um, women are, are getting more in the workforce. They're smart. They're kind of moving up in the world. And that's not going to be without resistance. It's, it's a change. Uh, I used to do that. I relate to that. Like when I went to court, I would not wear makeup, put my hair down, like, you know, wear like the most grandma loose clothes and really tight tights and like flat shoes because it, it, um, it was really uncomfortable. It was un uncomfortable with, with the comments and the way I was treated. Like it, it was blatant. People would try to touch you in court and uh, it wasn't a good experience. So going into uh, the workforce made me do the same thing as you did. Put away a lot of my femininity, kind of start locking it away little by little, be more and more masculine because smart and, you know, smart wasn't good enough. And uh, pretty is not a complaint enough, like being a pretty girl in the workforce, you know, being sad to not be taken seriously is not a thing to do. You, you get up and work, but unfortunately this, this exists and a lot of girls have to have to deal with it going up. And I don't think it's going to go away like anytime soon, well, you know, that fast, but it's a change that we all have to deal with in, in our careers and, and adapting. <laughs> I just want, you know, all women to stop trying to fit in. I think that's the hardest. And I had to play the roles, you know, and I was, uh, especially uh, what I went through the last year. And uh, when I got diagnosis that I have stage three cancer, and that was like the worst week in my life. And I was kind of going through through their stuff I've done and the way I behaved and how I was scared to audition, you know? And I was like, I was like, this is so interesting. What if I die in six months? No one would freaking even remember me auditioning and forgetting the lines or me thinking even about it. Or I went on a stage and I forgot something. I was like, why didn't I live my life to the fullest? Like why I wanted to be, super nice girl, I'm a very grateful artist. You don't pay me money, it's okay. I'm gonna live by just listening to my music. You know, I'm, I'm gonna go and I remember like I was already established celebrity and I had to wear something. I, I would try to uh, make my clothes because I couldn't really afford it. Because all the money go to men, you know, everyone gets your money. <laughs> and I was thinking like, why I didn't stand up for myself? Like, what if I really die? Like, what? I was like, God, please don't take me. No, I have to re rearrange everything. I have to re almost rethink and just to enjoy myself more because what if we die in one week, you know? Like, or in a, in a year, like, we're gonna regret that we were scared, that we didn't wear that red lipstick and we want it so bad. And, uh, and I think when you're cute, especially you have this like baby face, I'm forever 20 and everyone's like, oh, cutie, what did you do? Especially here in America, they have no idea what I've done. You know, they have no idea that I pay my bills by myself since I'm 16, you know, like, and they would never even think because you're cute. So sometimes it's on my way, especially when you want to do some business or stuff like that. I was like, oh, little cutie pie, what do you know about life? So I just want us all to like, especially women, just to chill and uh, enjoy every day, you know, and stop being so hard on ourselves. Whoa. Okay. 
that was a lot. But when Mika starts, you don't stop her. Her storytelling is amazing. But we'll get to it. Just take a minute, take a rest. We're coming back. So Mika, this is such a Mika thing to do. You dropped a bomb and just went saying that you were diagnosed with a street stage three cancer. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a great way of working it into the conversation. But let's go back to that because it, 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 it was such a big moment in your life. And it's been such a big moment for everyone around you. It was a very private moment. Um, and it was very unexpected. You... Um, we kind of jumped into this. So I'll just give the backstory a little bit. You and Chris got married just the year prior. You were planning a wedding. You guys were kind of just starting to get settled in. And you were, you were I'm, I'm assuming, shocked when you got this news. Um, of course, we talked about it later. But it's, it's, it's a big moment in your life. It shook a lot. Um, people look at you and you've had this career and you do what you do and it's kind of forgotten that every life has its its um trials and this is this was a big one for you not that you haven't had very many i'm sure somewhere in the conversation you'll drop another one but this was a really big deal yeah i think it would be a big deal for anyone who loves to work anyone who loves to build career especially changing countries and I always felt like I cannot afford to stop. Like I can't. If I travel, it usually was including work as well. Like yeah, I would never just go in just, you know, to Cancun or whatever and just rest. So I think for people who love to work and what they are doing to start feeling a little bit less you know, like you have less energy, you can do less. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm getting depressed. And I remember, so it, uh, so my wedding was in December and in February, I remember I got really depressed for no reason because I was sitting crying and I was like, Chris, everything is good in my life. Why I'm feeling this way. So when cancer started appearing, people get depressed. They don't want to eat much. And I always was like, I don't know what I want to eat. Like your uh, appetite's going down. I did start bloating already, but I just thought I'm a bad girl. After the wedding, you're just eating wherever you want. You're having too much fun. You need to go back to work. I did already book a, a benefit cosmetic campaign. So I was pretty happy how my year started after the wedding. And, uh, and I remember our common friend, Irina, she was like, what's happening with you? Like, you don't want to talk with me like that much. And like, you, I was like, honestly, I didn't even know how to ask people for privacy because I was always there for everyone. Like, I always have enough energy. The common question is, Mika, are you not tired from yourself? You're always keep going, you keep talking. Like my husband, he's like, are you not tired yet? I was like, no, why would I be tired? So then I was like, oh my gosh, I almost felt embarrassed that I cannot handle the long conversation as I used to. Right, right now we talk and I'm like, fine. So, so that was kind of a first thing, but I just thought, oh, finally depression hit me. In Ukraine, we don't talk about depression either. It's a very like you, if you say you're depressed, it almost equals you need to go to psychiatrist and you are going cuckoo. Like depression has such a different meaning. I wish, and I hope I can talk more about it on social media, but it's very hard for me because I've never really experienced till the last February. So I would just keep going, you know, I would keep going. I step on the glass, almost like universe is test, telling you like, hey, stop running. And I remember we went to Paris and then to celebrate my birthday, then come back. Even the little holidays, I had my family, my friends, we were running around again. And again, that, you know, Tommy and energy was like, oh my gosh, what's happening with me? So it was happening February till August. I was not feeling well, and uh, but I still wanted to work. I was very into acting because of the wedding. I did less acting. I was very into uh, wedding and preparations. 
and I was missing it so much. So I booked like a big campaign for Target. Um, then I did our four days big shoot for world campaign for Hyundai. And I remember I'm dressing up and I work with models. So, you know, I was like, always, oh, what did I forget here? I'm like five, four, <laughs> not tall. And they're all skinny. And I remember my time, I was like, geez, it gets so big so fast. I was like, you're going to go on a diet and you're going to go to hot yoga and lose all that fatting on your tummy. So guys, when you have a cyst, and I didn't know about, I wasn't aware about it on my ovary, you cannot do any sport because it can explode and then you're in a trouble. You can, you can die, literally. So me thinking I need to do better than just booking the campaigns. I want more. So I went to yoga after that, hot yoga. And I remember I'm like stretching and pulling that right side. I was like, something hurts me there. I was like, oh, it's probably just the muscle. I should pull it more. Now thinking me, I am literally the luckiest person on earth that it didn't explode there. Cause I would be stage four uh, last and can you imagine whole cancer? Like that's how I was so driven by results and not connecting to my body and listening. I was pushing, pushing, pushing. And then I book McDonald's commercial and they take me into four different commercials. I was like, holy fuck, this is it. I am actually making it in America. I'm going to pay my bills easily. And then on top of that, when you work with big brands, they you never know what you audition for. You, you write NDA, so we never know till I show up to the set and then I see the contract and it's Apple. I was like, oh my gosh, that's it. Like, besides my uh, big tummy and constantly bloating and kind of losing energy here and there, I was, I thought I am freaking winning. You know, I am killing it. And also the biggest problem, and I, Anyone who listens to us in America, please have health insurance. I'm like an advocate now. Hey, you have to have it. So that year after the wedding, I was like, I'm going to save a little bit of money. I don't need the insurance. And honestly, I even forgot because we, we have to jump in from November to December. This is the only the window, the window. And that's exactly when was my wedding. I was like, eh, I'm young and healthy. Like nothing going to happen to me this year, you know? So I booking all this successful summer for me and my, my husband is like, you have to go home because I lost my, because of I booked jobs, I lost my tickets to Ukraine. I said, eh, no family, I'm going to keep booking stuff. <laughs> and he's like, listen, like you've booked enough. I think you are pretty good for a couple of months. You can afford it. And you wanted to, to go to see your family and uh, celebrate your dad's birthday. Usually it's in August, because it's my dad's birthday, my best friend's birthday, and it's like the best months to see Ukraine. It's summer, nice. So I went there and my friend is, um, he's, she's like, oh, I have very good doctor you should see. I was like, thank you, because that's actually, that's why I'm here too. I just want to check my blood work. It's way cheaper than in America. I was like, this is great a great uh, time to do it. It was like, we don't know about our hormones. We don't know nothing. I was like, what if I can just get pregnant easily? Like I need to get serious about my stuff. Like I'm 33 already. So I need to check on it. So this is another important thing. Uh, Cause around that time you had just gotten married. I remember right after you had gotten married, you were thinking about having a baby like within the first year. Um, when we came, we were your bridesmaids and we came over before the wedding and you're like, right after the wedding, I'm getting pregnant and that's it. So I booked on a second January, I booked benefit cosmetics and I was like, Oh, that's a great sign. I want to work a little bit. So again, work and loving what you do. This is, this is a lot about balance in my life. And my story is going to show you how much you have to balance. You can love whatever you do right now, but it has to be a little bit of balance of listening to yourself. You know, it's not, uh, it's not about your, like even physical health. It's also about your mental health. You know, when I felt sad, I was keep pushing an audition because they want it. I wanted to succeed. I wanted the results. And then I could honestly, I could die. I could have died. Easy. 
easily on that yoga. If the hope that cancer would like expose in me, I don't even know what we would do. It's common. It's common when you're, when you're creative because you yourself are the commodity and you want to push, 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 and you have these dreams and business and business and you become so much your work that you forget that you have to take care, not just of your body, it's important that you have to take care of your mental health, you know, you have to check in with yourself emotionally, and then how much your physical health has to do with your mental clarity and your motivation, your clarity to understand why do you want this competition, at what extent it's hurting you, you're in, you're in pain, you know? Uh, what what is it going to take to stop? So anyway, let's go back to, you're, you're back in Ukraine to kind of see a doctor after months of having problems pain and other issues the whole last year was like i was 50 percent and and then the hardest part that was every month i was getting worse and worse and worse and worse so i went to ukraine i saw her she was an amazing doctor and she's like hey you have a big cyst how don't you feel it i was like huh i was so surprised i was like it was me but it wasn't some crazy pain and my sis was huge like it was huge it's not we don't talk about like small little cyst you know it was a big one usually people already in the hospital i was keep going nothing gonna stop me kind of she just wants to freaking run around and she's like i think you would need a surgery and when she told me that honestly it kind of felt like she says you have cancer because I, and she didn't know anything because ultrasound doesn't show you cancer. Like that's why it's so hard to get diagnosed in such an early stages because usually we show up to the doctors when we are almost dying and we feel really bad. That would be my case. And I really got lucky because I was thinking about babies and the career was going bad. I was like, okay, maybe this is not going to be this year, but I really want to know what I'm standing at. After, after 30s, I think we all should like do that and check on ourselves just to see some, and every case is going to be different, right? For some woman at 35, she could be fertile. And some woman at 25 could barely be fertile. It's so crazy. The more I was reading on it, some women go on a menopause at 28. What? <laughs> You know, and then I, at 33, I thought, oh, I'm so young, you know, I can, you know, we just don't think. And I think we are just not that educated about it and about our hormones and how we can check to see if we are, how much we are fertile, how many acts, what our reserve is still. So I highly recommend, it's a very cheap uh, test that everyone can do every year just to know where you are, you know, because some, especially in our world, it's not easy to meet a man or a woman. Like it's not, it's really hard, especially right now is quarantining. So, and if you are older and into building your life, right. And you know, what if you, you will meet someone at 40? It's like, you want to have that chance of having a baby, even at 40, 45, whatever. So I'm highly recommending, I'm like a big advocate. Honestly, this is the first time I'm really speaking out, out loud about this topic because I've never talked. I went super privately on social media. My mom didn't want it to anyone to know because then, because then it's all over the years and my mom is stressing that everyone is calling her. She's like, I don't want dad to know it. So dad didn't know because he had a heart surgery. So we went kind of all private about it. Uh, okay, so I wanted to talk about oh, how I got diagnosed. <laughs> See, guys, I can talk. It's already, we're 50 minutes. How much are we talking? Oh, uh, you guys yeah. that I probably will need a surgery that uh, this, this is not going to just disappear. It's too big. And what I know about cysts, it's only one type and it comes and goes, you know, when they uh, burst. And she's like, oh, no, there is a lot of different cysts. And don't just take that easy. And uh, I said, oh, my God, no, I'm scared. I just came for a holiday. My husband is in America. Like, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do surgery in America. She's like, okay, we will um, try to, uh, with, with some pills, we will try to make that cyst smaller so the surgery goes better. And we're going to observe it at least for two months, how, it's, how you're feeling, how it's going, growing, not. 
but the best way usually are they give you like some hormones so then that cyst is getting smaller i was really hoping and then um i had to perform uh, in london it was in uh, in glasgow not in london but it was a trip uh, on the wedding and i said i'm gonna come and i know how you promise hey i'm coming to your wedding and you just don't show up as a singer as a special guest i was like no i'm gonna do it i'm already taking my pills and i remember i will remember this london trip to the rest of my life because i was struggling i looked like six months pregnant and i was just trying to see their castle and just walking and just enjoying my life. And after I got home, I really was like, dude, you need to get more serious about it. Like you and your body are separate. Like you have to start connecting and understanding that uh, everything you want to do and you've done in your life is because your body, you cannot ignore the bloating. You can't ignore that something is really worse happening. In my head, I just, because I didn't have an insurance, I thought I'm going to wait till January to do the surgery so someone nicely does here or with the new technologies and everything. But in October, at the end of October, my husband is like, hey, like you talk less, you know? That's a huge symptom. Something is off. And you don't wake up at 6.30 anymore. You want to sleep longer. And then you go to bed at 4.00 p.m. because you want to just lay down it wasn't like I was I just I was I started feeling pain. you literally just like falling down super fast with every day with every day he's like I just want you to face it because I think you might need a surgery earlier than you think so that was kind of crazy because that was his kind of intuition I'm very intuitive since I was kid I never I never known anything about energies or whatever I always I always kind of felt something, always was like, I was felt guided. And he's like, I'm giving you a week. If you don't feel better, I'm just gonna send you there, go with you, whatever you decide. But I think you really, dude, you just have to face it. You are not doing good. And at the same time, guys, I was trying to audition, audition. And I got like these huge opportunities with her. Uh, Oscar nominee director, you know, and I, and I show up and also I was starting walking my shoulders like this, you know, like uh, up front. So it covers my, so I was coming like auditioning. I was like, dude, after that, I was like, what are you doing? There is an actor who was nominated for Oscar who's going to direct this commercial and you poor thing, first of all, got scared because you don't feel great. And after that, I was kind of, I think this is it, trying to make more money while you're really feeling like shit. Camera sees everything. You can't lie for camera. So then it took a week and I called my doctor. I was like, hey, do you have a good surgeon who can do it? So I flew home in, in November, last November. And um, yeah, he just did a surgery. He came. That's how they're not very um, like cute with you. Like here, hi, how are you feeling? Oh, in Ukraine. Literally, um, two hours after surgery, like barely like talking and understanding what's happening after their anesthesia. And he's like, okay, everyone leave the, leave the, um, the room. I was like, okay. So everyone's leaving the room. Okay, so I did everything. Nothing spilled. Uh, I did not like your sis, like at all. It looked really bad. It probably something bad, 90%. But we'll see. My ops is going to show and left. Literally, I said, I'm not even kidding. I'm not even exaggerating. That's how he talks. Very, da, da, da. No smile, no how you feel. Like, and I'm laying down as a like, holy fuck, what just happened, you know? Am I okay? What does it mean? And I'm literally under anesthesia, anesthesia still. So my brain is like, what does it mean bad? And then like how it looks like. You never ever think about cancer. Like never bad, whatever happens no cancer so then first uh biopsy comes in and she invites me and my friend her husband her son takes me to the doctor 
I was like, why the heck whole family comes with me? And I was like, what's happening? I was like, guys, I can't handle after a surgery appointment. No, no, we're just gonna go with you. And, and she like was behaving super strange all day. Now I know the doctor called in the morning and said, hey, come with her because people take it very differently. And I'm honestly very grateful for my doctor because the way she told me that it was cancer, they found cancer in you, it was like the nicest and most positive uh, thing she've ever, like someone ever told me. She was like, hey, we found some uh, bad cells in the cyst. And she was like super like calm and positive about it. I was like, oh, bad cells. I was like, oh, so, and, and I keep joking, you know, around. She's like, she, say, she sees I'm not like really understanding the word bad cells. She's like, yeah, it's cancer, but don't, don't stress, don't stress out. We're going to recheck in two other laboratories. So they send it to Europe. They send it um, to the best in Ukraine just to make, always try to retest three times. to Because re, this is a very harsh a diagnosis, you know, when you say someone cancer. Otherwise, she's like, no, we're just going to wait. The wait moment, guys, is the worst. That's when you wake up and you're like, do I have cancer? Do I not? Is it cancer? Is it not? Do I need more surgery? Not. And then she tells me, you probably need another surgery. I'm crying. I don't know why the most I was scared of surgeries. Now, it's I think it's the easiest. I think the journey, emotional journey is the hardest, is to wake up every day and just to decide that no matter what, I want to see this day through love and through positivity. And I'm going to turn every single negative thought into positive thought. And that was, I think, the hardest thing I've ever done. But now I feel I'm a happier person because I've done that. Because you have nothing to do. You're facing with cancer. They are still doing your diagnosis. You can't really work. You don't really want to work anymore because you know your your energy is just below. So you really kind of meditate every day and try to turn everything negative into positive. I think that's the only way I was able to go through that. Everything amazing always comes from that place of unknown. And in that place of unknown, you can always fall into fear and worry and negativity and spend that waiting time getting sucked into this tornado that you can't get out of that's not healthy for you stress is not healthy for your immune system especially when you're going through um, what you're going through and there are other life decisions to be made so you have to kind of be mentally clear but it's it's the biggest lesson the biggest lesson is coming through with that mindset and being this positive like i remember i of course we all talked with with friends but I remember like when I saw you for the first time I I think it was before the surge it was before the surgery and I thought to myself like you were very positive and you were very uh, calm and collected like I have this experience with my mom my mom was diagnosed and she's you know we've had we've had our own family journey with this and she was similar she's very strong and you know, it was kind of a similar first phone call and you know, she wasn't giving them that reaction of, oh my God, and they wouldn't let her off the phone because she was so like, okay, okay, what's the next step? Like, and you're very similar. You started immediately your, your research, your plans and your thought process. And what exactly what you said was, I'm doing everything that I can. I've, I've planned everything that I can. I know everything that I can know. And at this point, I just have to be, um, present yeah I have to be present because I think the hardest for me was to really be at the moment because I always know what I'm doing in one hour I'm always planning I'm always jumping with my thoughts I always have hundred thousand ideas in my head so sometimes it was even hard to give interviews I remember I just say and I'm already like okay and then it's a meeting and then okay are they gonna pick me up or no and, and she'd keep talking to me and then I just jump in it just the brain, the brain was just going nuts, and um, the the last year just because of the surgeries, because of their uh, treatments. Thank God I didn't need chemo, and she went a very very modern way about it. It was very interesting. Uh, there last week I 
and met this girl who was diagnosed with ovarian cancer as well at the age, I think, 25. And so she tell, was, and tell how rare it is first. First of all, it's very rare for younger women. And usually it's a very common old, oldish women, uh, like in 50s and 60s. That's when ovarian cancer likes to be. And it's, you know, when you're so young, and, and I, I, you know, I've never been told that I look my age, um, they always like, oh, something hurts here. Oh, you young. It's just a guess, you know. No one thinks something serious can happen to you because you're young. You know, you're cute and, 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 um, and everything, whatever happens with me bad, I never I show like, oh, I don't feel great. I, I, I had a, an appointment. It was so funny. I had an appointment at cancer center. So now every three months I go to check in my blood work with a whole, there's a lot to check. It's like a whole thing now. And I, sh all, every time I go to cancer center, I was like, oh, now I'm six months after, you know, now I'm good. And I always try to wear bright clap colors because when you show up there, the energy and everyone who is sick, you see bold people, you see people in a wheelchair and you see like so much and younger, like I saw this cute seven years old, where like all, I was like, why you like, so it, it just affects me. And I was like, oh my gosh, how lucky I am. Can I help them? Like, I'm already kind of fine, you know? It, it does take me longer to recover than I thought. And the blood work, it's, it's coming back or better and better. But so I'm like all this pink, uh, pink pants, all their rainbow like there. So, and I come and there is another patient and he was on the wheelchair and we come kind of like together. And uh, that's, and then you need to now pre-check, they check your temperature, they give you new mass and all that. So she thought I was a friend of that guy. You know, I was like, I was like, no, I'm a patient. She's like, you are? I was like, because oh, she was like, oh, you can go back to your friend. I was like, I don't know this man. She's like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm a patient. She's oh, really? So she didn't even think I'm the one who are dealing with cancer now, you know, when dealt with cancer. Because I think... I think that's the only way to go through anything we are going through. And I know whoever is listening right now probably has own heart style going on and, and, and health and, and they're being lonely or divorcing or coming back with someone, you know, it's just so much. I just know it's sounding super cheesy right now, you know, live your love with love and, but I think it's the only way because no one can help you. Like at that moment when I was sad, first of all, your friends, including husband, they don't know how to behave with you. When someone knows that you're going through a tough time, whatever you're going through, we need to be aware. And I was, I'm very grateful that I was on a, on a state, uh, like state of my mind that I understood. It's like everyone doesn't know what to talk to you about. Like they don't know. They are scared. Oh. They no one really knows how you feel inside, not even your thoughts. And in a normal circumstance is thoughts, right? How does someone feel? What did they think about this? What's, but, but with this, it's, it's also like physical, it's pain, it's, it's hormones, it's tiredness, and no one really knows. And, and it becomes this dance, right? People want to be there, but they, they don't want to overstep. They don't want to like, make your life and your story only about cancer and only talk about that and but they also don't want to ignore it so for for anyone who's around anyone you're right going through a tough time it's 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 hard to be those people and and, and we should just take a look and because then we build resentment oh or oh my best friend she doesn't talk to me, you know, or she didn't call me and she told me she would. Oh, I texted her. She didn't, I have my best friend who would not respond to me. I just now love her because I know she doesn't respond, not because she doesn't want to, she literally forgets. But I need to think about that, you know, because we usually want to teach people. Like, I want you to know I'm hurting right now because you didn't 
text me and she legitimately loves me to death. She even flew uh, to be with me on my second surgery, the hardest surgery ever, just to support me. Like, I know she loves me. Like, why wouldn't she wanna? Like, she literally forgot, forgot because it's stuff. But in my head before I will build it up, oh, she didn't answer me once, two, three, I'm gonna screenshot it and then on a test time, hit her hard and then we have resentment and then we argue and then we feel like shit so now i've learned and and when i go was going through i was like if you want to talk to someone just don't sit and wait people just maybe don't know you want to maybe they just just go rant if you want to rant about something so i think that's the best way to be about it if you guys really need help just ask for help i was the worst about asking help I, oh my God, for me, it's a torture to text someone, hey, I need your help. It's like the worst. Now I'm super easy about it. I've learned that lesson the hard way too, just to ask. And I think you, you said a few stories during this conversation that has this, this tone to it that you consider some things a weakness, like femininity, emotionalness, wanting a family and children needing help, vulnerability, when you are physically weak, you push yourself to take the job. So all of this comes down to like courage to accept your vulnerability and accept help or ask for help or conversation. So it's a big one. Like Mika said, we can really talk. Now this is going to go on for a while. Of course, this is a good story, but I think this is a good place to stop. Um, in addition to everything, everything we do in life, one of the most important things is who we surround ourselves with. And I think that's a good note to leave off of. Uh, we'll come back with the story. And with that, my lovely friends, I will leave you with some advice. Dream big, be brave, and be happy. I'm already proud of you. Thanks for listening to Lovely with me, your host, Bahar Ansari. If you like this show, please subscribe and share with your friends, colleagues, and family. And please leave a review on iTunes. If you miss me before then, check out baharansari.com or connect with me on social media. Join us next week when we talk more about laws, love, and life. See you soon.